Why does God create? Vatican I said this, God does not create out of need. God needs nothing. God is God. Without the world, God would be completely perfect. Therefore, why did God create? Vatican I said, so as to manifest and share his glory. That's a wonderful answer, reflective of the long tradition. You know what it means, brothers and sisters? It means that the entire universe has been loved into existence. What's love? Love, Thomas Aquinas said, is willing the good of the other as other. Love is not primarily a feeling, though it can be accompanied by feeling. Love is a great act of the will. When I say, I desire your good, not for my sake, but for yours. To love is to break out of the black hole of the ego and say, my life is about you. So listen, in regard to the whole of the universe, love is the ground. Because God doesn't need the world. But God has willed it into existence. What else does creation say to us? Creation says that nonviolence is the fundamental reality. How come? It's true. Listen, go back to all the old ancient myths. People that want to bring the gods and goddesses back, I don't know. I'm glad they're gone. Look at the old myths. God or the gods bring order precisely through violence. By conquering another god, by conquering other sets of gods, by wrestling something into submission. Violence leading to order, that's the old lie, by the way, believed from the epic of Gilgamesh all the way to Rambo. That's the great myth. But listen to our tradition. God creates ex nihilo. God creates from nothing. That means in a sheerly generous, non-violent act, God speaks the world into existence. He doesn't wrestle anything into submission, doesn't conquer anyone, but now God wills through a sheer act of love the whole world into existence. Now, now read the Sermon on the Mount with new eyes. When Jesus says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who maltreat you, he's not just saying, it's nice to be nice. You see what he's saying? Live in such a way that you are congruent with the deepest grain of the universe. That's what creation means. Nonviolence is the fundamentally real thing. What else does creation mean? It means whether we like it or not, we are connected to each other. Thomas Merton said, prayer is finding the place in you where you are here and now being created by God. Isn't that a cool definition of prayer? To find the place right now where you are being loved and spoken into existence. When you find that place in you, you found the same place in me and the same place in him and the same place in her and the same place in Brother Sun and Sister Moon. When Francis said that, he wasn't just whistling Dixie. That's good Catholic metaphysics. Because of creation, we are all linked to each other through the center that we share. Now read again the ethics of the Bible. It's not just saying it's nice to be nice. It's saying you must acknowledge by the way you live that what connects us is always more basic and always more powerful than what divides us. We are ontological siblings. You know what I mean? We're brothers and sisters at the most fundamental level of our being. That's what creation means. What else? Look in that great symbolic story in the book of Genesis. What does God give to Adam and Eve? Practically full reign in the garden. By the way, a garden, a place of life. St. Irenaeus said this, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. God has zero interest in being our rival, zero interest in keeping us down. What God wants is for us to be fully alive. And so he gives Adam and Eve practically full reign in the garden. Eat of all the trees, save one, I'll get there. Save one. But you know how the church fathers read that wonderful liberty in the garden? They read it as God's permission for science and art, conversation, politics, friendship, all that makes life rich and wonderful. That's what God's saying. Go forth, be fruitful, multiply, eat of all the trees in the garden. 
That's what God wants for us. Life, life, life. Fully alive. And look at the figure of Adam. Oh, how the church fathers love this. Adam gives names to all the animals. He catalogs them. Catalogon. He names them according to the logos which God has placed in them. Adam, therefore, is the first scientist and the first philosopher. You know, friends, that's why the conflicts between science and religion are always tragic. What does all science rely on? The intelligibility of the world. Every scientist, biologist, chemist, psychologist, whoever, every scientist must believe that reality is fundamentally intelligible. It can be known. Where does that conviction come from? From this deep, mystical, religious intuition that the whole world has been spoken into being. In the beginning was the word, intelligence, and everything came to be through that word. Friends, all science rests upon that fundamental assumption. So there is Adam naming the animals. He's science philosophy. Finally, Adam walking in easy friendship with God, that beautiful illusion in the book of Genesis that in the cool of the evening, Adam walks with God. Well, for desert people, that's the best time of the day, the cool of the evening. Walking in easy friendship. You know what that makes Adam, according to the church fathers? That makes Adam a priest. What does a priest do? A priest leads worship. What's worship? Adoration. Pope Benedict gave us this beautiful etymology a couple years ago. Adoratio. Ad ora. It means to the mouth of. To adore is to be mouth to mouth with God. Breathing in the divine life and then breathing that life back in this great rhythm of grace. That's what we do every time we worship. Every time we adore, we rediscover Eden. We rediscover friendship with God. Okay. Act one creation, with all these overtones and undertones. We must always begin our preaching, our teaching, our presentation of the faith with this first act. You never begin with sin. You begin with sin, the whole conversation becomes skewed and negative and puritanical. You always begin with grace. 